Hey, uh, how's it going out there? Um, it's Adventure Vin with an impromptu video. Those of you who've been following, uh, been documenting a lot of my Route 66, uh, Route 66 planning. I'm going on a Route 66 trip in August, or I've been talking about my KLR 650 motorcycle, some modifications, maintenance, whatnot. Uh, well, today I'm up at Edwards Air Force Base, and I'm at their air park. Before I go any further, I want to let you guys know that, uh, um, yes, I'm Mac duty Air Force, been in the military 31 years, and even though I'm in the military and I'm at a museum, I still ask permission to do any kind of uh, photography and documentation. It's always smart to do that these days. I think that goes uh, uh, for not, you know, just be sure if you're filming on a military installation or right outside a military installation, ensure that the proper authority knows what you're doing and why you're doing it, um, and then you won't be, you won't be harassed. I got 31 years in and I don't need to do anything and uh, go with the idea that it's better to ask forgiveness than ask permission. No, uh, I'm too much into the ball game for that. Uh, so I'm up at Edwards Air Force Base that used to be partly known as Muroc Dry Lake. It was changed to the name Edwards Air Force Base and there's a plaque right to my left I'm going to read to you in a second. So behind me, uh, you guys can see this SR-71 Blackbird. There's actually, this thing was designed in, right here in Palmdale, California, and there's a really cool Blackbird Park. Um, they call it Blackbird Park. They got three of these. One's a trainer where it has a, a cupola right behind it. I might be able to actually uh, film that today, now that I think of it. I might be able to bring it to the park and show you what those look like. But let's start, start at the beginning here. Pan around and you'll see some of the, uh, um, some of the plans we'll be discussing. Let me go to this plaque real quick. Oh, by the way, I am cheating. I'm not on my KLR. I'm in my 06 Mustang GT, which is parked over there, I'm trying to get as much shade as possible. I'm trying to beat the wind and the sun. So here's the plaque, and I'll read it out loud. Um, first of all, it talks about this tree being planted on the 50th anniversary of Edwards Air Force Base. Then here it says, on the 8th of December, 1949, Muroc Air Force Base was renamed Edwards Air Force Base in honor of Captain Glenn Edwards, who gave his life while expanding the envelope of aviation technology. So those of you who uh, aren't, I did my first eight years in the Army, and I wasn't really familiar with Air Force. And then right before I got out of the service, or come out contemplating getting out of the service, I switched over to the Air Force, and I'm, and I'm glad I did. Not everybody, um, not everybody, uh, would be happy with the Air Force or, or, or make that change, but it worked out well for me. But so Air Force bases today, if they have like a name like that, uh, it's usually because of somebody who had passed away. Look at this thing. This is just unbelievable. Look at this shot. You know, I should take some stills of this. This is just freaking amazing. <laughs> this, this thing flew, this is, this is basically a spaceship. It flew outer space. It flew out of the atmosphere. And the guys that would pilot these things were actually in an astronaut suit. Um, boy, I'm sorry I'm jumping topics. Let me just finish real quick. So, on the Air Force, so the names of Air Force bases were named, uh, if they have a name to it, of a pilot who had either perished in training or in combat. Other than that, priorly they were known as Army Airfields, and generally they were named that way for the, um, the vicinity, the location they were in. For instance, the base I'm at is March Air Force Base. Um, after Peyton C. March, who died in a training accident like in the early 1920s, I believe. And it was probably known as Alessandro Air Base or Alessandro Army Airfield uh, because of the guy they bought the property from, last name was Alessandro. So as the story goes on, these, these SR-71 Blackbirds were reconnaissance aircrafts. Uh, the U-2 was the predecessor to this. You know, and I'll probably be corrected on this, but um, the U-2 did this, a similar job, and the U-2 is still being used today, still till today. But one of the things they say is that these things either leaked fuel or they burned a lot of fuel. I'm not sure, but I knew they flew faster and higher than the uh, U-2 aircraft does. Obviously, there's there's this is all declassified now, so you can get as much information you want on the SR-71. I think the duration and the and the firm altitude is still classified. Um, I don't know. I wouldn't know it. And if I did, I probably wouldn't be able to tell it. These, um, what they do, they block off these, these uh, 
these engine manifolds so birds and critters don't make homes out of them. That skunk is, is a symbol for the skunk works. I want to say uh, Lockheed Skunk Works and uh, in Palmdale, which isn't too far from here, from Edwards Air Force Base. Which Edwards Air Force Base is in the high desert, I would say if it was the, it would be the Mojave Desert. Um, one of the criteria is nothing's going on today that's classified or, you know, high speed um, intel stuff, but I was told just to avoid um, filming angling towards the flight line, which um, I'm on the other side of these chains. I guarantee you these chains are here for me not to walk over them. So just to keep in the graces of everybody, let me walk back around the SR-71 and I'll go towards the front of these so we can see what these other planes are. Um, I, know, I know a lot of planes. I mean, it was an interest of mine since I was a kid. Uh, in fact, one of the things that first interested me in the military was a book I read about B-17 bombers in World War II. You've got to be picking up this wind. <laughs> I'm going to go inside the museum in a bit, but let's walk around the air park. This is, I've been to many, many um, air museums. This is one of the smaller ones I've been to, but it's also one of the most unique ones being that Edwards Air Force Base is the flight test center for the United States Air Force um, for things that have to do with electronics, uh, aviation, avionics. I don't work on planes, I work on radars, so I'm not uh, familiar with everything they test out here. I've had quite a few different jobs while I've been in the military. Starting off my time in the Army, I was, uh, I was a paratrooper, I was a medic, I was a Cav Scout, and I switched over to the Air Force, where I was a flight medic, and my current job, I'm a aerospace operations. Fancy name for, well, I'm not gonna say it's a, it's a boring job, but just a fancy name for what I do. All right, so this aircraft, I think those are fuel pods on the, on the wings. Pretty sure that's where the fuel is held. This is a T, this is a T-33, and uh, this is a Lockheed. Anything that starts with a T sounds for trainer. Um, SR, SR-71 is surveillance reconnaissance. Um, a B would be bomber, C, cargo, F, fighter, A, attack, um, A, attack, P, pursuit. We don't use all those, in, all those, most of them we use now. We use the F identifier, the S, the SR, the KC, KC is for refueling. Um, but we don't use, oh yeah, actually there, we do use A for the A-10. And there's an A-10 here, I'll show you guys in a second. Here's another trainer. The reason why we just saw two trainers in a row is because this is a um, test flight center. So it makes sense to have a lot of, look at that radial, look at that engine. Wow, look at that bird poop. <laughs> I think that would be a fun plane to fly. I think any of these would be a fun plane to fly. I think this was a Navy asset. No, it says Air Force on the side. Okay, this one's going to stump me. This is a Corsair. Now, there's a Y before it. Um, y, I think, means experimental or not so much as being tested in flight, but it's not the, the it's, it's in the experimental phase of the version or the airframe. I think that's what the Y stands for. That A is the attack identifier I was telling you about earlier. So this is a Corsair. Although it says Air Force, Air Force might have been testing it, but I believe the Corsair was a popular one used in the uh, for the Navy and the Marines. And if you look on the side, this is kind of a cool thing. This, that's actually the boom. I'm pretty sure what I'm focusing in on is the boom they use for uh, refueling. And this thing here, this big javelin spear looking thing, you know, I want to say airspeed, but I don't know. And it might just be an apparatus that was used just for the testing purposes. So I uh, apologize, I don't know. This is one of my favorites. Okay, this was, this is a, I'm going to say, okay, what I'm going to call it is an F4 Phantom. It had many different identifiers. It could actually have an A on it. Uh, this is probably one of the test versions. That... I want to say underneath is a uh, droppable fuel tank. 
uh, additional fuel tank. They can actually drop it if they wanted to uh, go faster. This one had that real unique design on the tail of the aircraft where the tail would bend down and wings in the front would bend up. Very prevalent uh, in Vietnam. There was a version called the Wild Weasel, which they had uh, two guys were in there and the Wild Weasels actually sought out enemy radar, went right to the radar to take out the radar for other uh, aircraft to follow. Okay, so they're calling this one the YF. So once again, maybe in the experimental phase, but uh, going for the fighter version of the uh, F-4 Phantom, of what I know as the F-4 Phantom. McDonnell Douglas made this. Uh, this one, I want to say, I'm going to guess that this is a F-111 Aardvark. I might be wrong, but this one, I believe, was the, the, the pilot would sit side by side, pilot and co-pilot, or the pilot or the electronic warfare officer would sit side by side in this, called the Aardvark because of the long nose. And I think this was an electronic attack aircraft. Uh, I forgot about that too. Sometimes the E-identifier is electronic attack. So in the Phantom, you sat tandem, one behind the other, which is more often what you see today. But I believe this is the Aardvark where two guys sat side by side. Let's see how close, oh, look at that, I'm right. So one, one, one F, uh, F-111A aardvark. So, I mean, it's just so interesting. I'm so happy that it's coming. Okay, this, this one, I'm gonna guess, I'm gonna guess on this one. Okay, the fact that it says NASA on the tail, the fact that it says NASA back there, I'm gonna guess that this is one of the chase planes that they would use to follow other aircraft as they were testing other craft craft while they were airborne, these chase planes would follow uh, within the vicinity or close behind it to document anything that happened in flight. And they would also use these to escort the shuttle that would land here at Edwards Air Force Base in California. It was slotted to land here. And I did have the opportunity and I actually watched the uh, Endeavor land here at Edwards years ago. I think it was like in 19, I wanna say 1994, 95. I actually saw the Endeavor, the Endeavor's press release, not the rollout per se, but the Endeavor Space Shuttle's uh, press conference release. I was actually there in Palmdale, and then the Endeavor is now at the, um, the museum by USC, and I've actually seen it there. So kind of cool, an aircraft that I had, or a space shuttle that I had seen land uh, prior, to, prior to its missions uh, at the press conference, Saw it land here, and now I've seen it at the museum down in Los Angeles by USC. Fortunately, this plaque doesn't say anything, but I'm going to say that is an F-16. F-16, and the same kind of aircraft that the uh, Thunderbirds use today. I hope I'm right on that. I am not familiar with helicopters at all. Um, this looks like, uh, obviously it's a bigger helicopter, not used for attack, transportation, or rescue. Maybe this helicopter would be something that would um, recover, like if a pilot had to eject or bail out anywhere out here in the desert. I, I don't know. I honestly don't know. And unfortunately, there's not a plaque here either. But I wouldn't know the first thing about the name of that, the version, or, or what it was actually used for. This also, this can, although it looks like a, it could be a C, uh, C something, C stands for cargo or transport. Um, a T is training, so you don't have a T for training, and then they don't put a T on top of the transport ones either. But it could be used for that, or or if they have electronics in there, it would fly next to them. I know they use two De Havilland Dash 8s for uh, electronic monitoring for testing, but I, I'm not familiar with this one. Let's see what this is. This is a North American. I can't even see it this so bright. A CT 39A. So a cargo transport, a cargo trainer maybe. It was originally developed as a private venture to meet USAF requirement for twin jet utility trainer. So that's another trainer. This looks like something. Oh, one thing I wanted to mention, and I probably can't, I'm not gonna film it. I'm not gonna ask, even ask permission, but the if you're familiar with the I Dream a Genie show, the, uh, the um, building that I forgot the guy's name. The building that they walk into every morning is right behind me. It's 
a little bit down the road right behind me and a lot of people that know I dream a genie or know of that building uh, would go there and it's a NASA building and just because I'm doing this unofficially I believe if you get you can get a NASA tour and you could get more stuff more in depth and maybe I'll do that and yeah, do a NASA tour I didn't had no idea what this is but this is going to tell me this is an F84 uh, Thunder Streak made by a company called Republic low, pro low profile aircraft it has some French markings on it This is even U.S. Gloucester aircraft. It's called a Meteor. It was Britain's first operational jet aircraft and the only operational Allied jet to see service in World War II. Ooh, look at that. Britain's first operational jet and the only operational Allied jet to see service in World War II. Prototype G41, I'm going to come back to this. Very interesting, in March 1943. Remember I mentioned the de Havilland's that were electronic warfare, or not electronic warfare, electronic monitoring for testing? Apparently the same company, de Havilland, made the turbojets for this. And if you can see it here, and I can't because for some reason the sun's just too bright, it's blurring out my screen, but it talks about this place being called the Muroc Air, uh, Army Airfield, or Army Air Force Base. Well, check that out, people. That is the first... Now, whether this one... Um, in 1959... Hold on, let me read it to you. In 1959, this particular NF-111... I'm sorry, NF-11... Was converted to tow aerial targets and redesignated a TT-20... After its service ended about 1969. It flew under civil civilian markings... Until it was flight delivered to the museum in 1993. So... Uh, this one, I don't know if this particular one saw combat, but this model did in World War II. Amazing, I had no idea that the Brits had uh, jet-powered aircraft that saw any kind of action in World War II. This one looks like a definite transport. I don't know if I got that. You can see that tail, that tail on the back. God, look at that, that's how swept back it is. Look at how tight it would be. Don't know what this is. Don't know. Uh, a UC-45 Expediter. <laughs> I don't know what the U uh, stands for actually, so I apologize for that. Made by Beach Aircraft. Oh, another trainer. Yeah, I'm going to swing around real quick and I'm going to show you... Uh, there's the SR-71 again. It's just a sleek looking, sleek looking aircraft. Another helicopter. Uh, Marines it makes sense because this has that collapsible rotor. No, it's not a transformer. Wouldn't be something. See that thing turn into something. <laughs> but, um, so Marines, this was used up. Uh, probably they would collapse them like that to put them in uh, below deck when they would store these on aircraft carriers. Uh, I apologize. I do not know the. Look at that exhaust system in the front. I do not know the the name of this. Look at this guy. Oh, you know, I saw one of these at Herbert Field. And these, the one I saw at Herbert Field, I think was actually used as a close air support aircraft. This one's definitely a trainer. The ED on the end of these tails, by the way, designate which bases they're from. And if that picks it up, it says Edwards. So uh, another side by side. Very low profile. I think this one would be fun to fly, like driving a car. Look at this thing. I'm sure. I'm sure there'll be information about this inside. I'm gonna do two separate videos. You know, one will be Edwards Air Force Base Air Park outside, and then Edwards Air Force Base inside museum. Interesting aircraft. You know, it's gonna tell me something. Is that little black hump on the back is like a sensor of some kind. So I'm going to guess they were using this to monitor stuff. Um, back up, I'm missing this guy. Okay, this one, this one, the U.S. uses as a trainer. The Koreans, I believe it's an F-5. We use it as a trainer. I believe it was also portrayed as the MiGs in um, Top Gun, the original Top Gun movie in 1985-86. 
uh, and these were trainers. It was you would train on this. I guess it has some of the familiarities of the F-16 I showed you earlier. I'm sorry, F-15. No, F-16 I showed you earlier. The ones that the um, Thunderbirds fly. The F-16 has a single tail. The F-15 has a has two tails. But yeah, so this would be a trainer, a T-38 I think, and uh, but the T-38 or T-5, T-5. But in Korea, the Korean military uses these as actually fighters. So I think they call them F-5. Let's see how close I am to any of this. T-38, not T-5. Okay, so we call it a T-38 Talon, which is a trainer, uh, jet trainer for fighter pilots. Um, and if any fighter pilots are watching this and they want to correct me, believe me, I'll take the, I'll take the criticism. And if this is not the exact type of airframe that was used to portray the MiGs and Top Gun, I'd like to know that too, but as I understand it, the T-38 was. So U.S. platform, we would call that the T-38. South Korean military would call that the uh, um, the F, uh, F-5 fighter. I'm gonna get to those things in a second. What I think that is, without getting close to it, actually, I'm not even gonna guess because I'm gonna sound stupid. Not that I don't sound stupid now. Um, this one, I have no idea. But look at the blade. That blade is huge on that thing. The propeller is huge on that. And those manifolds, I have no idea what this is. Let's see here. Piper, PA-48 Enforcer. Don't know what it's enforcing, but it seems pretty enforceable to me. You know, this is pretty cool. If I live closer, I have more time. They got these adopt the plane program things going on. You know, that'd be so cool to adopt the plane. And this one has been adopted by Detachment 5 DTS. So uh, this aircraft maintained by. So how cool is that? You know, they put this out for us to see. And then you got people that volunteer their time. They probably come out and clean it, maintain it, um, update stuff. And not really, not so much update it. I have no, I'll have to ask what that big thing is. I mean, that just looks like a, looks like something you see on the moon. <laughs> okay, let's go take a look. There looks like there's a, some kind of rocket stage way out there, which um, I'm not gonna take you guys all the way out there. <laughs> but yeah, there's a, some kind of booster stage, rocket stage. Yeah, check out that, <laughs> look at this beast. <laughs> Who knows what this thing is? I mean, seriously, can you imagine this? <laughs> hey, mom, get out of the carpool lane, something's behind us. <laughs> oh man, yeah, look, oh. I was kidding, but look, it's got rear view mirrors. <laughs> I was actually kidding. I mean, I'm not saying this thing gets, I'm not saying this thing would be on the road. Oh, now I gotta see the front of this. I thought this was some kind of trailer. I thought that I didn't, I thought they would pull this thing. Look at that. Are we there yet? <laughs> oh my goodness. What in the world? Okay, so. On this 4th of July weekend, if you're traveling down the freeway, this guy ends up getting behind you for any reason. You thought our V's were bad? Yeah, you want to get out of this guy's way. He'll probably eat you and spit you out the back. Oh man, I'm kind of glad actually. I wasn't going to come all the way down here, but... Those things up there must be sensors. I'm going to say my best wag guess is that this is some kind of portable tracking station this I'm gonna, I'm gonna attempt it oh my goodness I don't know what that is but all right say goodbye to gargantuan beast of a vehicle get out of its way so there's the air park. I'm gonna walk over to the museum now. But before I conclude the air park portion, uh, I'm gonna go over to this, um, go over to this uh, A-10, A-10 Thunderbolt. And I was in the army back in the 80s. Well, not like it was like 81 or two. I was in the army, 87, 88, 89, uh, 90. Um, I believe that's when the A-10 started coming around because I remember they used to fly them. I was up at Fort Lewis. There's the uh, there's my chariot. That's an 06, my 06 Mustang GT. So I'm not on my KLR today. 
riding in that, a little bit more comfortable, better air conditioning. All right, so A10 Thunderbolt. As an air operator, what I do is, one of my jobs I do is I call these guys in or I, no, actually I don't. I'm an enlisted guy, so I gotta be correct on that. I'm not the one that actually will call them in, an officer will do that, but I'm the one that would find this in the inventory and uh, for cast missions, close air support. Those huge engines, what these guys can do is fly very low and slow. These things were instrumental. I was in the Army during Desert Storm, but these things were instrumental in Desert Storm because one thing, they could take a lot of fire and their, um, their hydraulic system can be pretty well damaged, but they could still fly because they had all the redundant uh, infrastructure of the older technology where things were being ran by wires. So they were able to actually land. But we would call it a cast, but now that I'm in the Air Force, so someone says, hey, there's some troops that need close air support, CAS, C-A-S. And I would immediately know which airframe to go to. So I would start looking in the air tasking order for uh, this, type of, this type of aircraft. And I said, yeah, we have two, we have this in this area. I'd tell the officer on where they're at, and then it would be up to him and coordinating with other people to uh, get them launched and dedicated to that mission. So I kind of like, if you think of it this way, I'm the type of guy that's in the inventory room and, and way or in the tool room, and someone says, hey, we need this type of effect done. I find the proper tool, tell them where it's at, and it's up to the, um, to the duty officer and the CAS officer if they're gonna use that tool for that moment in time. Hope that explains it. It's a huge gun in front, and this guy does carry, I believe does carry bombs, but there's the gun in front. And this one has the Y identifier, so this was a uh, prototype test, but A-10B, A-10B. So I'm wrapping up the outside. There's another F-4 Phantom. I believe, oh, you know, uh, South Korea still flies these military-wise too. We do not. These are out of the inventory. We do not fly F-4 Phantoms anymore, but uh, I, I know for sure South Korea does. Those of you who don't know me, um, that was that's my theory of operation in South Korea. I know a lot's been in the news about it recently. I can't tell you any, not that I can't tell, I don't know any details on, you know, what for sure is going on as far as um, our activity over there goes. So, all right, well, we're gonna approach the museum now. The sign says closed, but I talked to the gentleman earlier today and uh, I'm gonna get some shade and I'll sign off on this portion. So, um, I think they even said they're closed on, closed on Mondays, but they're opening it up. So, looks like I got about a half hour going on this. So let me conclude it. Hope you guys enjoy the air park. Small one, but very unique and um, specialized in what they have to offer. So, I'm gonna close this off. Uh, be sure to like, subscribe. I'm not on my motorcycle, because I so I can't say f don't forget to ride. But I hope you enjoyed this little version. And as I see more stuff, uh, this is about part of my adventure. All right, have a good day, I guess. But I'm gonna come back when we get to the inside.